Okay, so here are the rest of your phylum Nidaria notes, which is basically just going to be a survey of the different classes within the phylum. So first up, class Hydrozoa. This class is small, but there's relatively you have a relatively common number of species, pretty large as well, 2,700 total species, and they are mostly marine. A few freshwater species do exist, exist but for the most part they are marine. Um, really important, they mostly exist in colonies. So they have specializations in feeding, producing their medusae, and defense as well. They also have three distinguishing features. So the nematocysts only exist in the epidermis. They're not within the other parts of the body. The gametes are epidermal and released to the outside. And then the mesaglia never contains those amoebid mesenchyme, which are kind of like your all-around cells. So there's two stages, of course, the polyp and the medusa stage. So the polyp stage, there's two main types of polyps that exist. And these are definitely terms you need to be highlighting since they're in red. So the gastrozoid is a feeding polyp. So this one is what the original planula, which if you remember, the planula is that little thing that's released when the zygote is formed. And this develops into this type of polyp. So the colonial growth of the rest of the colony comes from the budding off of this one. And this entire colony, kind of cool, shares a single gastrovascular cavity, body wall, and the parasarch. But the gastrovascular cavity is the big here because most of them have their own. These in the hydrozoa, the polyp stage, when they make a colony, they all share this big, long, interconnected one. So the gonozoid is the reproductive polyp. So this one produces all those medusae, which are the other form. And they once again do this by budding. So once they mature, they break off and swim out to produce their own. So here's just a little more of a picture on the polyp stage. So your gastrozoid is letter C, so it's this one here. And your gonozoid is letter B. So if you look here, all of the little medusae are going to come out this as they're formed. So the medusa stage is very similar to what you would imagine as a typical jellyfish, but it's not as complex as what we're going to get into in a minute. So the nerve ring itself coordinates the movements, and the gonads actually hang from the oral surface. So the gonads, remember, are your reproductive organs. So taking a look at the hydra, this is within this class hydrozoa. The hydra is one of the most commonly known. These ones actually do live in fresh water. And they're on the underside of floating plants, so mostly clean streams and ponds. These ones do not live in colonies, so they live independently. And they also lack a medusa stage. They can reproduce both ways, so they either do it asexually if it's warm or sexually during the fall. And something to note, they are mostly sessile, although they can move. They can contract side to side. They just kind of thrash this bottom part back and forth and it helps them move. Um, they can also somersault and they can produce a gas bubble down here at the bottom and use that to float. And they are carnivorous, so they feed on small crustaceans, things like brine shrimp. So another well-known species in hydrozoa is the Portuguese man of war. So that is right here. You see these a lot on beaches and these are not actually in the true jellyfish class. These are the hydrozoa, and they're not as complex as other jellyfish. So it's just a single gas-filled float, which is why this always floats above the surface like it does. And their polyps and their modified medusae live within these tentacles. So they live in there, and then that's how they're released. They don't actually have a stage where they're secured to the bottom of the ocean. So I want you to go ahead and pause your video here and make sure you sketch. This is a hydra. Make sure you sketch this and label all these parts. I also want you to sketch this drawing. You don't really need to worry about labeling very specifically as well with this sketch. This is a man of war. So your big ones here, gas bag, the gonozoid, if you remember, is the reproductive the gastrozoid is 
that helps with feeding but also helps produce more. And then the nematocyst, this is your stinging cells on your tentacles. So pause this and sketch this as well. All right, so the next class is class Cyphozoa. This is your true jellyfish. Okay, these are true jellyfish because your medusa is the dominant stage. They are all marine, 200 total species, so nowhere near the amount of species as the hydrozoa class. And they do have quite a large size range. Their common colors, orange and pink. They can be harmless or have dangerous stings. It just depends on the species. As a general swimmer rule of thumb, it's good to avoid helmet shapes that have long tentacles and these fleshy lobes you see through here. So a little bit more about this class in general. Their habitat, they can be from the Arctic to the tropics, so they're not just warm tropical climate dwelling jellyfish. But unfortunately for us, their favorite habitat is around beaches. Their body, they have thick and gelatinous mesaglia, which is why they're actual jellyfish, and they feed on all types of small animals. A few do feed on fish, though, so a little bit larger prey. Some of them are suspension feeders, so the plankton actually sticks to the mucus, and there is one kind of crazy species in Florida that actually rests upside down, and its tentacles either catch things or it can survive on photosynthesis. So reproduction. There's that term planula again. Remember, that's before it develops into a polyp or a medusa. So this settles and forms your polyploid larva, and then which is actually your polyp. So the polyp then can live several years, and what it does is the polyp just buds new medusae. All right, so I want you to go ahead and pause here again, and this is going to be your sketch for the Cyphozoa. This is just a true jellyfish in general. Notice how there's a lot more that you're labeling instead of on the Portuguese man of war, for example. So these actually do have arms and tentacles. So class Cubozoa, these ones are your really deadly ones. The video we watched in class is on jellyfish from this class. There's only 15 total species. These ones only live in warm tropical waters. So your venomous ones are found Indo-Pacific, so over Australia era, area, India, those types of areas. But there are various species found all over the world in tropical and subtropical oceans. Their body is cube-shaped, so pretty easy to remember. Cube-shaped, cubozoa. They have about 15 tentacles that hang from each corner. Each tentacle, this is why they are so deadly, has about 500,000 nematocysts. That's what causes the stinging. 500,000 of those cells on each tentacle. And there's 15 per corner. So you're looking at 15 on every corner and each of those 15 have more than 500,000. Um, these guys are also a little more complex in that they have 24 eyes on the body, six on each side. They have two types though. 20 that are simple, just light versus dark. But they actually have four complex eyes, so one on each side. It has a lens, a cornea, and an iris, very similar to our eyes. They are actually active swimmers. So if you remember from the beginning of these notes that we took in class, jellyfish in general can't really control their side-to-side -side movement. They can only move up and down the water column. These guys, they can move whichever direction they want to, and they actually hunt their prey using speed and vision. And the underside has a flap, so that flap actually creates more of a controlled water flow, which allows them to control their swimming. Um, they also have the venom, which is used for defense and to catch prey. And like we watched in class, sea turtles can, are unaffected by them, and they actually eat these jellyfish. And in terms of reproduction, their polyps that they do have are very small or even unknown. So there's still not a lot known about these jellyfish. So the final class for Nadaria is Anthozoa. So these are more your sea anemones and your coral, basically, are the common species here. So these can be colonial or solitary. Once again, very large group, 6,000 total species. And once again, they also lack a medusa stage. So they are marine only, so no freshwater and they're found at all depths, and they are the largest class. So their mouth also leads to a pharynx, not directly to that gastrovascular cavity that the other animals in the phylum have. Um, and they also get energy from green algae. 
that live inside of their cells. So these green algae do photosynthesis. They also kind of cause them to have a green color. So these algae are really contributing as well to the well-being of these species. So differences from hydrozoan. So anthozoa and hydrozoa are very similar to each other. And then your cubozoa and, scyth and scythozoa are very common to each other. So the hydrozoan differences, so the mouth, like we said, leads to a pharynx, which then leads to that gastrovascular cavity. The mesenteries inside, those are those spaces. If you look, it's labeled down here, incomplete, incomplete mesenteries. Those divide this cavity. And the mesoglia does have those cells that can differentiate. And kind of interesting, we typically think of things like sea anemones as being radial, radially symmetrical, but that's really only on the outside. Internally, they're bilateral. So sea anemones, specifically, solitary, they're usually large, they're very colorful, so white, green, blue, orange, and red are the most common colors. Their habitat, they are usually in coastal water, but they can be in all tropical water, and they do attach a couple different ways, either to solid substances or they burrow in soft substrates. And they have symbiotic relationships. So we're very aware of clownfish and sea anemones, but they also have relationships with hermit crabs. And they actually will travel with the crab. They live on its shells or its claws. When they live on their claws, the crabs use them as defense. They'll actually use the sea anemone as they move their claws around. And they also have that algae on their tentacles, which sometimes gives them a green appearance. So the anatomy of a sea anemone, so once again, vocab terms you should be highlighting as you write these down. So the petal disc is for attachment. The oral disc is where the mouth and tentacles are. The mesenteries are arranged in pairs. Those are what creates those spaces, and they allow for water circulation. And the acantia, these are inside that cavity, and they're like almost like a stinging cell, but they what they do is they just basically help subdue, eventually kill the live prey after it's captured. Um, and then... When sea anemones are threatened, they do contract and release those fibers, and they tuck into their cavity. Um, they do have predators, sea slugs, crabs, and some sea stars will eat them. So movement, a couple different things. They can glide on their petal discs. They can crawl on their sides. We watched that one video of that one detaching and swimming away. They can also walk on their tentacles or float using a gas bubble. Um, feeding is kind of interesting. They eat invertebrates and fish, usually whatever comes near to capture. But they will capture fairly large prey. If you look at these pictures, you have a crab and a starfish being consumed by a sea anemone. Um, something to keep in mind as well, if an anemone has very short tentacles, they're usually just suspension feeders. So they feed on a lot smaller things. Reproduction-wise, they can asexually reproduce two ways. They can do something called petal laceration, which means they move, but they leave just a little part of their petal disc behind, and that grows into a new one. Um, longitudinal fission, remember, fusions together, fissions apart. So an individual will actually divide into, I misspelled that there, into two, and into two missing parts, and then, oh, into two, comma, and then the missing parts are regenerated. So sexual reproduction, they can be monoecious or dioecious. Remember, um, dioecious is both is both are separate. Monoecious means they're in the same, so mono one. So monoecious species, to keep them still having that diversity within the species, the male gametes will mature earlier than the female. That way they can't self-fertilize. And it can be external or internal. And cleavage of the cell results in that planula again, which settles and then eventually forms an adult. So clownfish relationships, a couple things. The fish actually secrete a mucus on their body to prevent them from those stinging cells because they also have the same thing that jellyfish have. And it provides protection for this fish and some leftover food. The fish, on the other hand, has been found that they do they do protect a little bit and remove dead tissue, but the newest kind of development is that they provide these ventilating movements by swimming. So by swimming, they're actually helping water flow on the anemone. All right, so I want you to go ahead and pause here and sketch this. This is your C anemone diagram. And last for this part of this class is the coral. So there's two types. So we have stony coral and octocorillian coral. So stony coral, 
These are what form your coral reefs. They have a calcium carbonate exoskeleton. So this provides protection, a place to live when threatened, kind of cool. They totally retract into the skeleton if you look at this picture here. Um, some can be solitary, but for the most part, they are colonial species. And this colony can become quite large. So also fun fact, the expansion and the feeding occur at night. So usually during the day, they're just working on kind of staying safe from other animals. But at night, they do expand or they feed. Um, they can be raptorial or suspension feeders, and they have sexual reproduction similar to sea anemones. All right, so I want you to go ahead and stop here or pause here and sketch the stony coral, which you'll notice is very similar to the sea anemone sketch. And then your octocorallian corals, these are common in your warm waters. So these are going to be more of your tropical coral. They have eight tentacles and eight mesenteries, and the body walls are connected. So once again, we have that connection within the colony. There's also an internal skeleton. So these examples are things like sea fans, sea pens, your sea webs, your red coral, things that don't always look like a living thing. They kind of almost resemble more of a plant-like structure, but they are actually coral. So the final thing we're going to talk about is phylum tenophora. So this is a different phylum, but it's very closely related to phylum nadaria, so that's why we're discussing it here. So these are known as sea walnuts or comb jellies, and there's 90 marine species, once again, all marine. Uh, most of them are spherical, but they can be like a flattened or elongated, so more of an oval. They don't have pneumatocysts, so they don't have those stinging cells. They have adhesive structures instead. And really important to note, this is why they are not considered nadarians. But they are known for their bioluminescence. They actually produce these cells in their body that kind of light up like Christmas tree lights would. And they swim with their oral end upward or forward. So they have a contractile spiral filament around the straight filament. So they don't necessarily have all the tentacles like jellyfish do. They have just a few. And there's a spiral and a straight, and this is what helps catch the prey. They do live in cold waters, so they don't live in the warm waters that a lot of jellyfish live in. And they also have an anal opening, so they're a little more highly complex than a jellyfish because they do have two openings. And they are monoecious, so... Both gametes are in the same body, and they're shed through the mouth. And external fertilization, once again, a flattened larva, very similar to that planula. And then the last thing for these notes is I need you to pause here or just stop here and go ahead and sketch this as well. This is what a typical comb jelly would look like. So not as complex in terms of labeling. I'm really not concerned with you knowing all of that. I just need you to be able to recognize it and know the different parts.